some of us know about bacteria as something that can hurt people. Um, and maybe some of you have direct experience with this. Has anyone here ever had an ear infection or a sinus infection? Raise your hand, we got one in the back. It's not, not too much fun, right? And what's happening when you get an ear infection is bacteria, most of the time, are getting into your ear and making you sick there. That's, that's, that's really what this is. It's a type of bacteria that makes you sick. So those of you who did get uh, an ear infection, what did you do to get rid of it? What do you think? Took medicine? Sure. What kind of medicine? Antibiotics. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we take this kind of medicine like penicillin or amoxicillin to get rid of our infections, and they work pretty well. They're really good at killing bacteria. But lately, we've really been running into a problem with these antibiotics, with penicillin. Um, and really, the problem has to do with natural selection. That is that when we use these antibiotics, they work against a lot of bacteria, and they kill a lot of bacteria, but they leave some behind. They leave behind certain bacteria that they don't work against. So it's just sort of a funny feature of this that the more we use these antibiotics, the more we select for and encourage the growth of the bacteria they don't work against. So it's, it's hard to sort of imagine what a serious problem this has really become. Um, but if you just think about what would happen if you got infected with one of those kinds of bacteria that penicillin doesn't work against. That would be very scary. Medicines, the, the traditional medicines, wouldn't be able to help you. And this is a growing problem in the United States. It turns out, in recent years, one of the most common drug-resistant bacteria, or, or superbugs, as we call them, uh, MRSA, one of the most common superbugs, has actually killed more Americans in recent years than HIV-AIDS. Uh, so it's a very, very serious problem. And the fear of these superbugs is really what brings us back to this stuff, to our, our silver products. Because it turns out that silver works in a different way from, say, penicillin or other antibiotics. And it works against a lot of the bacteria that antibiotics won't work against, like MRSA. Um, and also, as an added bonus, nanosilver is pretty cheap and easy to make. So people have started thinking, well, why don't we fight these superbugs wherever we can? Let's put silver in our, our teddy bears and in our hair dryers and on our food or in our food storage containers. And on the one hand, this is all well and good, right? We all want to prevent infections, and especially dangerous infections. But on the other hand, just because you can go out and buy this stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% proven to be safe. So I want to take a moment here and just look at the safety of nanosilver. Um, and I want to start by saying that nanosilver has never really made anyone seriously sick or endangered anyone's life. But on the other hand, it, does, it, it has done some other kind of interesting things. Uh, and specifically, I'm thinking about this. So this is a guy by the name of Paul. And about 14 years ago, Paul got a rash on his face. And he decided he would deal with that by making up, uh, making up his own homemade solution of nanosilver, kind of like this, and rubbing some on his face and drinking some. And it worked. His rash went away. So Paul started drinking this every day. And gradually what happened is, is what you see here. He sort of turned this smurfish color. Um, and so it turns out, I, I like to think of this, what, what happened here, as Paul developing, like a photograph. Uh, because actually, th these are sort of ancient history now these days. But it used to be when people were taking pictures with film and not with digital cameras, that that was the number one industry in the world where silver was used. Uh, because silver reacts if you hit it with light. And so the same thing happened in Paul's skin. He got lots of sil silver permanently embedded in his skin, and then he got hit by sunlight, and his skin reacted and, and developed, really, like a photograph. It's a fairly rare condition, uh, Argyria. And it turns out it's, um, it's not very dangerous, actually. Paul seems to have no other related health problems. But it is, as you can imagine, something of an inconvenience to be this, this gray purpley color, um, and he's permanently stuck like this. So that's Argyria. Other than this, and when, when silver is used in moderation, it seems like it's pretty safe for people. Uh, however, I added that, that phrase on at the end there, for people. Because obviously people are not the whole story here, right? When I'm using a product like this, not all the silver I'm using right now is going on to me, right? Some of it is going out. And along the same lines, if I spray my hands with this, Maybe I, I wash my hands a couple of minutes later, and the silver that was on my hands goes down the drain. 
This is especially a concern with this product right here, this washing machine that uh, I showed at the beginning. Every time you use it, you pump a lot of nano silver out when your load of laundry is done. So the question here is, where does it go from there? Down the sink and, and out of your house or, or out of the back of your washing machine. And in many cases, it'll go through some pipes like this and end up at a wastewater treatment plant, just a big facility like this where all the wastewater from your house goes. Now, the funny thing about these wastewater treatment plants is actually that they use bacteria to break down toxins and pollutants in, in our wastewater. So really what we're doing here is we're taking something that kills bacteria and we're sending it in just about a straight line to a place that needs bacteria to work. Uh, so this obviously is a concern, especially for the people who manage wastewater treatment plants. But, but there's still questions about what happens after that. Nano silver is very persistent. It's not going to go away or, or break down into something else. It's going to move through water. And so it's going to go to places where water goes, like streams, lakes, rivers. And so the real question here is, what effect is it going to have once it gets there, especially as more and more nano silver starts being used? Um, and so to think about that, I'm going to show just one study that was done a couple of years ago with fish. It's a kind of fish called zebra fish. Uh, and some scientists grew zebrafish in normal water, and they ended up looking like this at the larvae stage. And the scientists also grew some zebrafish in a nanosilver solution like this. Those zebrafish ended up looking like this. So as you can see, they have a lot of problems, right? They have a lot of defects. And they actually died at a much higher rate than the regular zebrafish. So this is a concern. And it turns out that, that nanosilver is actually really toxic to lots of kinds of fish. Um, but on the other hand, this is just one experiment. So it doesn't really answer the deep, difficult questions, like what effect is nanosilver going to have on whole ecosystems, or how much nanosilver needs to get into the environment to do damage. Those are tough questions to answer, and those are still questions that are being investigated all over the world. Um, but in the meantime, you all are left with a little bit of a dilemma. And that is, you can already buy this stuff. Um, it's, it's really up to you whether you, whether you want to decide it's worth it um, or whether these unknowns about the effect on the environment outweigh the possible benefits of fighting bacteria. Um, and so you might be wondering, what about the government? Is this being regulated at all? Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's a situation where, in some ways, the FDA and the EPA really haven't caught up with these new technologies. Um, so there's active discussions happening all around the idea of how to regulate nanotechnologies like this. And if you'd like to learn about that, I'd encourage you to visit this website here. Uh, it's the EPA's page looking at nanotechnologies. Or also at this page, which is a, another group down in Washington called the Project on Emerging Nanotechnologies. And they have a lot of great information about health and safety, about nanosilver as well. Um, and also, if you have any questions that are burning in the back of your mind right now, feel free to come on up and, uh, and just ask me right after the show, right now. Um, okay, thank you all very much, and have a good day here at the museum.